Nope. No. Okay, why don't we start maybe? Yep, sounds good. So uh, so I think uh, let's just dive in. You all know Alexei. Maybe if there are questions from last time, we can open the floor to start with that. Um, maybe then... before I do that, how about I just remind people just very briefly where we stopped last time so that if people are, you know, uh, those people who forgot everything, even before we do questions, maybe it'll be useful. Just very quickly, I just arrive at the same point, maybe in like three minutes, and then hold your questions, and then we'll, we'll do the questions there. So, uh, right. Okay, well, so... Let's go into it. So, right, there are new, uh, actually, um, I'm not sure if this happened, Caden. So I sent maybe like 30 minutes ago, I sent new slides that are a little longer than the previous set uh, because we could probably get through the first set of slides. So I don't know if, uh, did Daphne get a chance to post them actually? Maybe not. Uh, I will check. We didn't get an email from her, but if not, I'll put them on the Discord right now. Right, so, but you can still follow the uh, PDF from last time. And at some point it will just end and we'll have to, you'll have to switch to the new PDF, which is longer. So, uh, okay, good. So, um, um, okay. So last time we, uh, right. So what we're interested in is uh, studying the interactions between photons mediated by Rydberg atoms. Um, and last time we uh, quantized the electromagnetic field or rather reviewed the quantization. Um, and then, um, uh, we started discussing uh, this electromagnetically induced transparency. And let me just very quickly just click through those slides that we just, uh, that we uh, looked at last time, just to uh, uh, jot your memory uh, on, on EIT, and then I'll arrive at the slide where we stopped, and then I will uh, pause for questions from last time. Right, so uh, again, we did a motivation, quantization of a kinetic field, and now we're studying propagation of light through atomic ensembles under the conditions of uh, electromagnetically induced transparency. So we have an ensemble of atoms uh, that are three level atoms that mostly start in the ground state. There's a photon coming in. It's uh, near resonant with this uh, GE transition. Um, then there's a quantum field that describing this photon. Um, so we discussed that. Um, then there is a, a classical field that's coupling this uh, transition ER. Um, and this is given by this classical amplitude. Um, then we wrote down this Hamiltonian first, uh, um, you know, just the microscopic Hamiltonian, which has the photonic component, which came from our quantization of the NM field. It has the atomic component, there are N atoms. Um, then there's the dipole coupling, which we uh, uh, talked about in the quantization of the NM field, where each atom is coupled to the classical field uh, and the quantum field. Uh, then we plugged in our expressions for the classical field and for the quantum field from the previous slide. Um, and then we define the Rabi frequency that acts uh, right here. Um, uh, and then um, this coupling here, G, uh, is the uh, coupling constant of the quantum field to the atoms. Um, and that's acting sort of on this transition right here. Um, then we define these slowly varying operators and we talked about them uh, for quite a while. So we define these slices um, that are thin enough to get continuous fields, but uh, uh, wide enough to get much larger than uh, one atom in each slice. In each slice, um, we assume that all atoms, uh, are almost all atoms, are in the ground state at all times, and then we define this uh, slowly varying both in space uh, and in time uh, operator p dagger, um, which creates uh, an e excitation at position z, and here is the atomic density, um, and then this has these very nice bosonic commutation relations. Then we also define similarly a slowly varying both in space and in time uh, uh, creation operator uh, S dagger, um, which creates an R excitation uh, at position Z, which also has these very nice commutation relations. And similarly, we defined this uh, slowly varying in space and in time a photon creation operator E dagger, which creates a photon at Z. Um, so uh, I write it right here. And this again has these very nice bosonic commutation relations. And then using these slowly varying operators, we uh, rewrote our Hamiltonian as follows. Um, there's the linear propagation of our photons. So this is the free uh, photonic field. And then these photons are coupled uh, to the atoms. So you can uh, uh, annihilate a photon and create a P dagger excitation. This is an excitation in this E state with the uh, collectively enhanced uh, coupling constant g squared of n, where n is the density of the atoms. 
Uh, now this P can be converted, converted into S. So the E excitation can be converted into an R excitation with Rabi frequency omega. And then uh, we have this detuning delta, which just shifts the E state uh, down from this uh, resonant uh, uh, coupling. So that's where we stopped uh, last time. So uh, and now, uh, are there any uh, questions uh, from last time? No? Okay, well, last time there were a lot of questions. So I hope we, uh, you guys can uh, do a good job this time again. So Caden did a very good job last time with starting the questions and then uh, he motivated others to ask as well. So uh, let's hope we continue in this tradition. So. Uh, so no questions. Okay. I guess I'll ask, I guess I'll ask a question maybe. Oh, thank so, you, Liam. Oh, let me re-ask a question, which you answered last time, but I, not to my satisfaction. I'm still having a mental block of why, you know, I cannot consider G and an R and, uh, and a field that, you know, can be detuned from GR transition uh you can you can but let's yeah. let's i mean let's postpone i mean i just actually i agree i sort of the way i'm presenting it it's somehow poorly motivated i'm like why why three levels right like uh yeah 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 poorly motivated so uh the reason i did this is for i mean maybe it's a uh, you know it's just poorly uh poor, the the order is wrong so you will see basically in the next slide what's going to happen if i just have two levels and right. then having the third level will solve some problems. So uh, I see, why don't you I see. hold on to that question? I think it's just that uh, I just wanted to, uh, I guess I just wanted to uh, uh, get out of the way this ugly derivation. Uh, okay. okay, like at that's once, fair enough. So all three levels yeah. without motivating why I have three levels. So uh, sure. very good question. I'm with you. Uh, so, but I hope it gets answered. If it doesn't ask me again. Oh, and I'm missing okay. a hat here on the P. Um, but also, is it fair to say like, uh, and I, I think you alluded to this, like you can then just shut off the omega field, the classical field, and then see, you know, shut off this process, for example, of coupling R to G. Yeah, so we you will have, do that. You, we will you do have that. More no, you have more knobs by having both the quantum field, optical field, and classical yes. optical field. Okay, yes. good. You will see okay. it. I mean, that's, that's, I think, for the entirety of this lecture, we'll be a answering your question. And that's the okay. only thing we'll be doing, actually, I think. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Leo. More questions. Um, and this will be answered. And sorry, there's a hat here missing on the PO. I'll add it uh, next time. Sorry. Okay. Can, yeah. Question. Can, can, you, uh, can you tell us why uh, the detuning results in the term minus delta P dagger P? Something like that? Yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, like, um, yeah, it's there, there are a lot of approximations here. So, uh, one needs to kind of do a derivation, but basically, uh, it turns out if I do this integral of p dagger p over over position z, it actually counts the number of e atoms. So uh, if you go, I mean, so let's go to this uh, slide. So uh, so the way uh, p um, is defined, it creates uh, an e atom from a from a g atom, right? So let's ignore this, this complicated, uh, you know, the fact that there's the sum here. Suppose P dagger was just a GE. And then if I do P dagger P, it's become sigma EG, sigma GE. And remember GE is just an outer product of kind of, it's a, it's a matrix element from G to E. So if I do sigma EG times sigma GE, it's just sigma EE, it's just a projector on E. So a P dagger P just counts the number of E atoms. Uh, and it still turns out happens to be true even with this complicated sum here over this thin slice. So P dagger P just counts the number of these E excitations. Um, and if you're working with a single, if you're working with a single atom, your detuning would just be uh, in front of a, a sigma E E term. But now when we're working with continuous fields, it's in front of a P dagger P. But I think it's also maybe fair to say that, you know, with these definitions, your zero of energy is at at e. So, or, or sorry, your zero of you defined omega one as the uh, as the laser field that connects g to um, g to this dashed line, right? So we're right, right to the dashed line. That's 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 right. 
That's like, what exactly. makes That's the, the delta point. in front of them. Right. Yeah. Right. This was the point of our rotating, like slowly varying field. Like we define these fields that are slowly varying in, in space and especially in time. And that's why all of the large optical frequencies, actually, Kazar, you were asking about them uh, last time as well, which were very good questions, right? There's this, there was this really large optical frequency from G to E, but I didn't want to deal with this huge frequency, which is much larger than anything else. Like it's much larger than delta, than omega, than this G root 10. So I wanted to get rid of this. And effectively what I did by uh, defining these operators, I mean, I did it in this funny way, but uh, it's equivalent to uh, basically going into a, a rotating frame. So, uh, so this is not basically the same Hamilton as I had before. It's a rotating frame Hamiltonian. You know, you take some H naught, which is maybe not quite the H naught that I uh, had in the previous slide, some other H naught, and you go into a rotating frame. Uh, and this rotating frame removes basically uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, energy omega one of the, uh, of the E atom, uh, but because the E atom actually has less energy than um, omega one, there is some leftover energy minus delta right, when you go the rotating right. frame. And this right. is why it looks like the E atom is at negative energy, but it's a negative energy relative to this dashed line. And similarly, the R atom, because I'm assuming I'm in two photon resonance, the R atom has zero energy, right? There's no, uh, there's no S dagger S. So uh, it's this rotating frame. It's the, uh, like the epitome of you know, uh, AMO uh, physics, uh, quantum optics, so these rotating frames, which are very confusing to uh, uh, possibly you know, condensed matter. Uh, here's. Does it help, Kazra? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. More questions. Thank you. Uh, so again, thanks, Leo, for starting this. And now people feel, uh, you know, uh, they can ask questions. That's great. More questions. I have a question. <laughs> That's an important question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I have a question. I have a question. Um, um, <laughs> Sorry, can you once again walk through what each of these terms in this Hamiltonian means? Okay, great. I'll do it again. Perfect. Great. Why don't you, like, if, if, if uh, people who are not asking questions, why don't you all you mute all yourselves, mute yourselves especially while, while I'm answering, answering mute, mute yourselves? I'll wait for people to. Alexa, you need to unmute. We just muted everybody. Oh, I see. You muted everybody. Okay. I'm like, well, yeah, I so didn't mute myself. I didn't mute myself. How did that happen? <laughs> there's a single button that, that says mute all participants. So I, I do know, that. I know, I know. And then I send you a request to unmute yourself. So, yeah. Wait, anyway. you can't, uh, you can't, I see it. You can't unmute me like forcefully. Oh, yes. No. Yeah, that's good. That would be very embarrassing, right? Because what if I'm in the bathroom, right? That, I'm glad you can. Exactly. Come. That's why right. it's done. Yeah. Okay. Especially not the video. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, right. Let's walk through these terms. So, um, so this first term, it's just the linear propagation, you know, with a uh, with the linear dispersion of the uh, of the electric field. It used to be written in momentum space. So, in momentum space, it looks like you know a uh, h bar is ck, um, uh, but now it, it has this derivative here because I wrote it in position space. So that's just linear dispersion of the free field. Okay, that's the first term. This term right here says that I can uh, convert. I can uh, annihilate a photon and excite my atom from G to E, create a P dagger excitation. So P dagger creates an uh, atom in this E state. That's simple. You know, I, I annihilate a photon and excite the atom. This term right here, it annihilates an E excitation and creates an R excitation. And this is obviously driven by this Rabi frequency omega. So it removes an atom in E and creates an atom in R. Again, very simple. And P dagger P is just a, uh, says that the atom at energy E doesn't sit quite right here at resonance, but it sits delta below resonance. So, right. And, and there, of course, your com, uh, Hermitian conjugate, you know, instead of uh, like a, annihilating a photon and creating a, uh, an E atom, I can do the other way around. I can, you know, remove an E atom and create a G atom instead of then uh, I, you know, I emit a photon. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. And I think there were somebody else tried to ask a question. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe Michael there, uh, or maybe he accidentally unmuted himself. So, yeah. I, I was going to also say, maybe you can say a word. You know, we've had Jane's coming Hamiltonian in this, in this school already. So maybe you can say, make just even a partial contact right. of this. Perfect. That's exactly. So this term right here, 
you know, uh, is the is your James Cummings coupling, except instead of coupling a single mode of light to a single atom, I'm coupling a continuous field of light. So, uh, you know, I kind of have a, a photon at every position Z. So there are, there are many creation operators at any position Z. I'm coupling that to a cloud of atoms. So it's kind of the multi multi mode, multi atom, you know, version of that. But this mm -hmm. coupling is exactly a James Cummings coupling. Right. And because I have many atoms, uh, thanks to a question that somebody asked last time, uh, you know, we have this collective enhancement because any of your atoms can be excited here. Uh, and as a result, you know, this coupling is increased. So, uh, and this is why people want to use ensembles. If you just have one atom, it's pretty difficult to couple to it. So when I mentioned in the beginning of the talk last time that, you know, some people do this, you know, uh, Jeff Kimball was the pioneer, kind of as a pioneer in that. And it's very difficult to couple your light to a single atom. But when you're coupling to a cloud of atoms, you have this collective enhancement. It's actually pretty easy, uh, except that we want this coupling to be clean. Uh, and I will talk about, you know, what that means and, you know, how this comes about. And that's why we do three levels instead of two. But this will be a, the subject of this entire lecture. More questions? Uh, I actually have a question about this root n. Yeah. What I, um, the physics of root n is clear. The definition is slightly unclear and that it must come down to definition of p you know naively you know if i had single uh you know atom creation operator you know that would excite me from g to e i would have thought you know the state that i act on namely multi-populated g state would take care of root n automatically if i act on that many body state but so then I don't have to a priori take out this root n, root n automatically appears. So yes, can you yes. just say a couple of words, just pedagogically, right, right. why, it's, why it's I need to take definitions. it out? Yeah, yeah, right. So I want my, see, I want my, I set up my commutation relations between these p's, that's how I define it, to be like this. I, I want the commutation relation to be bosonic independent of the density of the atoms. Mm, I see, I see. So the denser I make my atoms, like something got to change, right? I mean, I either it like either my commutation relations of peace have to change, or the coupling has to change. So, uh, so that's mm. why. And, and I, I just increase the coupling because I want this to be nice. I see. I see. Okay. So you kind of factored out in the definition of P. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there was another question. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask. Uh, I see that our zero of energy is is at the dotted line there. Why is there not a diagonal term for the s's s dagger s? Um, because uh, so the s dagger s is the uh, r. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the zero. That's the funny thing about this rotating frame, you know. So maybe uh, I mean maybe I should have uh, sort of uh, belabored that even more. Maybe I should have started with just the uh, you know uh, two classical fields driving a single atom. So, but I assume that uh, you know I assume that people have done something like this in these lectures, but. Uh, like what happens is that uh, you actually have kind of three zeros of energy. You know, uh, you sort of, uh, the zero energy is at G, the zero energy is at the dash line, and the zero energy is at R. Um, and, you know, and my rotating frame kind of creates this. Uh, I, uh, you know, initially, you know, there are huge energy separations between them. But then when I go into the rotating frame, you know, uh, basically G moves up to the dash line up, you know, using this field and R moves down to the dash line. So they both sit here, but E is shifted down by a delta. Um, it's the basic rotating frame. Like if we, if I didn't have any fields, and I have my, you know, single atom Hamiltonian, I can go into rotating frame, which we also, you know, I guess can call the uh, interaction picture. And then uh, in this interaction picture, the Hamiltonian will be zero, and that's why they all sit at zero energy because I, uh, like, I, I uh, went into the rotating frame uh, with respect to the H zero effectively. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Right, and you should, uh, I mean, if, if you're not familiar with this, you know, basically, uh, you know, open, for example, these, uh, you know, Misha Lukin's lecture notes um, and, you know, open like one of the first lectures and consider this uh, EG two-level system, you know, coupled by a classical field. And then, you know, look how it goes into a rotating frame. You know, you can either define the slowly varying, uh, you know, uh, operator, which I did here um, for this uh, sigma EG, uh, transition, then it rotates more slowly. Um, or, you know, you can go into rotating frame by conjugating your Hamiltonian with, with, with uh, either the IH naught. Um, 
More questions? These are all excellent questions. I think it's also because it's block diagonal, so you can shift the zero of energy twice independently. Yes, like, yes, yes. There, there are two U's, you know, that can uh, rotate. One right. corresponding to one set of uh, field couplings and the other, the other set of field couplings. Right. More questions? Okay, well, keep asking. Um, good. So, so now let's write down the Heisenberg equations of motion for these operators. Uh, and we know how to do this because we have the commutation relations from the uh, from the previous slide. So, you know, just Heisenberg equations of motion just directly that come uh, from these commutators. Uh, and that's what we find. So uh, the evolution of E, you know, uh, comes from the, uh, you know, commutator of E with H. And this doesn't commute with this first term. Um, and this gives this uh, CDZ. Um, and it also doesn't commute with a, uh, comp, uh, with, a, uh, with a Hermitian conjugate of that term. And this gives our IG squared of MP, okay? We do the same thing for P. So the commutator of P uh, with uh, this term is not zero and it gives I delta P. The commutator of P with the, uh, with the Hermitian conjugate of this is non-zero and it gives uh, this I omega S. And, uh, and with this, it gives I G square root of F E. And finally for S, uh, the only thing that contributes is the, uh, is, um, is, uh, is uh, actually, oh, I see. I, I think my omegas and omega stars could be a uh, switch. This probably should be omega star, um, but it's from this term right here. So I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, this came from the fact that I was taking these uh, formulas from a uh, from a system where it's a lambda type system, um, where this r is below e, but r here is above e, and that's why my omegas and omega stars got messed up. So uh, it should be a star here, uh, but these equations are correct. Okay. In the end, I will assume omega is real anyway, so forget about all the stars. Okay, are any questions about where these equations come from? So I just write out Heisenberg equations in motion using the uh, commutation relations that I introduced in the previous slide. Okay, so now, uh, you know, uh, there is an important effect here that will be all important is the, uh, that the state E um, can decay with rate gamma. So this means that uh, uh, if uh, we have an atom here, this atom can be de-excited down to ground state G and emit a photon into free space. And this photon is just lost. It's spontaneous emission with rate gamma or perhaps two gamma. So I won't be too careful about this factors of two. And the way this is introduced uh, phenomenologically in our Heisenberg equations of motion is we just assume that our P, which is this uh, kind of uh, 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 creation operator for the E excitation it decays with rate gamma. However, you see there is a problem then, you know, uh, uh, this P has a, you know, a very particular commutation relations. It should have very particular commutation relations with P dagger. But if both P and P dagger decay with rate gamma, like this commutation relation will start decaying uh, and that's not good. Uh, so to do this, you know, people introduce this uh, Heisenberg uh, Langevin noise operator. So this is a kind of a, an operator that's dependent on both position um, Z and time T. And its commutation relations are designed to be uh, such that uh, it keeps the commutation relation of P unchanged. Uh, so with this extra term, uh, P has nice commutation relations at all times. And uh, the commutation relations of this term, they depend actually on what your uh, environment is. So in our case, uh, the only thing that happened, we assume that the environment, uh, this uh, 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 electromagnetic uh, uh, field is in the vacuum. So the only thing can happen is that uh, the E atom can emit a photon. So we assume that uh, there are no photons in the environment to begin with. So the G atom cannot absorb a, a photon from this uh, environment. It can absorb a photon from E, but not from the kind of the transfer from all the other modes that are assumed to be empty. So, and in this case, it's all very simple. So in this case, uh, the only non-zero uh, correlations of this noise is the F, F dagger correlator, um, while the expectation value of F is zero, the expectation value of FF uh, is zero. I mean, I'm dropping here the subscript on all of these guys uh, 
And then F dagger F expectation value is also zero. So this is the only known zero correlator. Yes. There's a question about what's the relation between this and Lindblad approach, the master equation approach. Yes, yes, they're, they're entirely equivalent. So uh, you can derive one from the other in fact. Um, it's an excellent question. More questions? Yeah, and these noise operator sh operators, they will not be actually important. I will, I will, I will ignore them in a second, but uh, I just wanted to set this up properly. Um, now, if we wanted to, uh, eventually the state R, uh, for now it doesn't matter, but eventually the high lying uh, Rydberg state, which will have long lifetime, uh, but you know, not infinite lifetime. And so it could also decay with rate you know, gamma S or two gamma S. And the way we would do this, it would similarly add a, a decay to our uh, S annihilation operator. And similarly, uh, 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 a noise term here, again, with similar uh, uh, noise correlations where this is the only uh, uh, non-zero correlator and all the other guys are zero, um, right? But uh, as I will um, say, th these noise terms will actually not play a role for the particular uh, calculation that we're doing. So any questions on this? Okay. Is there a good physical interpretation for this noise operator? I can't see physically what that is. Yeah, yeah, no, there is a, there is a, a physical interpretation. So it's basically uh, um, maybe uh, the best way to uh, think about this is, um, um, so um, the simplest case is, uh, let's suppose that this electric field, suppose this electric field is a uh, annihilation operator for, um, for a, a field inside a cavity. And then we would add a decay rate, uh, say minus kappa E plus then some noise. Uh, and what this noise is, is a, you know, kappa is a decay rate. You can think of it as a decay rate through the mirrors of the cavity. And then the noise is the, basically the incoming vacuum field that sort of comes in back through the cavity. Um, and because I define these P and S here as also a harmonic oscillator operators, you know, you can also think about them as, you know, some sort of a fictitious cavity, you know, it's a fictitious harmonic oscillator. So, uh, you know, uh, that is decaying through some, you know, fictitious mirror. So this is like, uh, um, this is the stuff that leaks out through the mirror and that's the stuff that's leaking back in. So it's maybe like from the vacuum, something can be scattered back into the piece. Yes, space. yes, it's, 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 it's the vacuum noise. It's the vacuum noise. It's these, uh, you know, uh, um, you, you can think of this as maybe a, like if P is a, uh, again, if you think about it as a, a cavity mode, that's, you know, uh, there's like some beam splitter um, where uh, through this beam splitter, some, st some stuff leaks uh, out, but then some stuff has to always leak back in. And it's this vacuum noise leaking back in that's uh, described by these Langevin noise operators. Thank you. Um, Thank you just, for the question. Sorry, uh, just a follow up. I, I thought that from last time, um, we're not thinking about the cavity or? Yeah, yeah we're not. I just tried to, I tried to, okay. uh, yeah, we're not thinking about cavity. So this is actually a continuous field. Um, and, you know, and P is also a continuous field. There's a, uh, you can create a P at any position, but I just tried to give an intuition for, for oh. where this is coming from. And to me, the simplest intuition is in the case where, you know, a P is maybe a, you know, a, a single mode inside a cavity. And then this would be a, the decay rate would be leaking through the cavity. And this would be the vacuum noise leaking in through that mirror back into the cavity. So I just said this for the intuition, but we're not dealing with the cavity. E is free space, so it's a function of Z and T. P is a function of Z and T, and S is a function of Z and T. Okay, thank you. Sorry, uh, Ma sorry. a matter question. So regarding the dimensions of this quantity, so the G and omega should be like frequency, right? But the, but the gamma is dimensionless. So uh, omega is a frequency, delta is a frequency, g square root of n is a frequency. So I just define things. That, so n is a density. So g square root of n is a frequency. Gamma is a frequency. Um, yeah. Yeah, but you have uh, gamma, the square root of gamma. Right, yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, so you can check. So um, um, let's see, so... Um,
Let's see. So you're, let's see, Emma. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so it looks like maybe, uh, maybe you're saying there's something wrong with the, uh, like, right. What happens to this, uh, Yeah, I think uh, you're you're right. I think maybe there's like um, hmm, I'm a little bit surprised. I thought I checked it carefully, but there could be there could. I mean, yeah, it looks like something is wrong with the. Uh, well, maybe maybe not. Maybe uh, um, yeah, it looks like something is wrong with the units of uh, you know position units, right? Um, okay. So, the, so maybe the frequency the frequency units are okay because uh, you know when ff dagger is a delta function. So it means that F uh, has sort of units of uh, one over square root of frequency, and this is precisely canceled. Um, uh, so this is, I guess, multiply, uh, I guess, square root of frequency. Sorry, and this is multiplied by another square root of frequency, and it gives me this gamma right here. So it's the same. The frequency units are okay, uh, the time units, but position actually uh, this confuses me a little bit. Uh, so maybe there's something. Um, um, the commutator. Ah, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, it's all okay. I mean, if I do my PP dagger, you know, P also like all of these guys, it's, it's all correct. So, uh, you know, my commutation relations for P, they're also PP dagger actually is a delta of a Z minus Z prime. Um, so it's actually, I define my things in such a way that E, P and S, they're actually not unitless. Uh, they all have, uh, you know, some square root of uh, position in them. Um, yeah, so, uh, but I did this to make sure the commutation is just a simple delta function. But of course, the delta function is not unitless. Yeah, I almost confused myself. But thank you for that question. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I was thinking about it because so you you mean your yeah, f will contain some dimension of frequency as well. Right. Exactly. It, con it contains a square root of frequency. Because you know, so you can just uh, the dimension of f just follows from this, right? Because uh, the delta function. Uh, okay. It's like, okay. Uh, yes. It, so yeah, P has a, don't have. Yeah. Right. So, so delta function is a dimension of one over T. So it means a dimension of square root of frequency. And if I multiply it by another square root of frequency, okay, you okay, precisely yes, get a full it. frequency. Yes. 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 So this doesn't include in the P operator, right? Right. Right. And the P operator has dimensions of uh, you know uh, uh, one over square root of position. And F also has a one of a square root of position coming yeah. from this delta function. So the units yes. are all good. Um, yeah. yeah, I see it. Thanks. Thanks. More questions. So oh, these are fantastic questions. I love them. So if you didn't want to put this, put these decay rates by hand, you would, you would have to introduce the electromagnetic field into yes, which, yes. in yes. which the atoms could decay. Yes, and, and that's how it's done, photon. you know. Yes, exactly. You to do it correctly, you know, you need to introduce then a, another Hamiltonian describing all the fields, uh, you know, all the electromagnetic fields, not just the uh, not just the one that I quantized here. Um, and then I, I'll have the coupling between every atom, you know, in that field, and I'll have to do this, you know, procedure to derive, uh, you know, these Heisenberg uh, evolution um, equations or equivalently right. the master equation that people asked about. And then this would come out correctly and I can derive these uh, Langevin noise operators, which actually like, thanks to your question, you know, you can think of them as acting on those, uh, you know, on the modes of the vacuum that I integrated out. Right, right. More questions? Okay, fantastic questions. Good. So, uh, so I just rewrote here these same equations. Uh, you know, you can forget about this uh, complex conjugate; it won't be important. Um, so let's start with a simple, simple problem. Let's assume that all atoms are initially in the ground state, so there are no no p or s excitations to begin with, and we assume there is only one incoming photon described by this uh, creation operator E dagger. Um, so then uh, I can just write down the wave function um, for the single excitation. So this, the, the Hamiltonian, like in the previous slide, it can convert me between E excitations and P excitations and between P and S, um, but it cannot like create extra excitations. Because of this decay gamma and gamma S, these excitations can decay. So this will be a kind of a evolution under non-hermitian Hamiltonian. So the amplitude of this function can uh, you know, decay. 
uh, but we will not create two excitations. So this is the single excitation wave function. And this E Z of T is the amplitude for having a photon at position Z at time T. This is the amplitude for having a, um, a, an E atom at position Z at time T. And that's the amplitude for having a, an R atom uh, at position Z at time T. So this is the single photon wave function, single excitation wave function. And now I could go back uh, to my Hamiltonian and I could now write down instead of the Heisenberg equations of motion for these operators, I could write down the Schrodinger equation for these amplitudes. And what they are is a boom. They're exactly the same as these guys, except there are no hats. Uh, and I just, uh, you know, this E here, you know, is the amplitude for this curly E dagger. Um, so, uh, and because I assumed uh, that initially I have uh, no P or S excitations and inside the medium, I also have no photons. So at uh, time zero, you know, E is uh, and P and S are zero inside the medium, except that Z equal to zero where my medium starts, I have this incoming uh, photonic field described by this envelope uh, E and of T. And now, you know, I have these differential equations, which we were joking about, you know, earlier today. You know, if somebody asks you, you know, uh, at a visa interview, you know, what you do for a living, you say that you solve differential equations. And that's what we now have. Uh, before it was this mess, these operator equations with these uh, complicated, you know, um, um, noise uh, 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 operators. But now, because we assume we have only one photon, the problem simplified to these, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, partial differential equations where E, P, and S are functions of Z and T, and they describe these amplitudes of E, P, and S excitations. Any questions? No? Okay. So we, we, so, do, we don't yeah. have, sorry, sorry. Yes, oh, yes, good, have... good, thank you, thank you, yeah. <laughs> no, just, we don't have F anymore now. Yes, exactly. So we don't have F anymore. Um, because uh, so uh, it's 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 because we're studying just a single photon, and for the single photon, you know, I mean, f doesn't matter because uh, uh, so the only thing that happens to the single photon is it can get lost, and then we have nothing left. We're a vacuum. All the atoms in the ground state and photons are gone. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that's exactly why I said that this uh, this f is not important. The f would be important if we wanted to, uh, you know, study the evolution of these guys and then study some complicated correlators, like, you know, like P dagger S correlator, you know, uh, as a function of time. Um, mm. So that would be important. But if I'm only interested in figuring out, you know, uh, if I send one photon, how many photons make it through? This, these uh, vacuum noise operators don't matter because they're vacuum. If it wasn't vacuum, uh, if my electromagnetic field in the environment had some photons in it to begin with, then it would matter. Then basically I can start with zero photons and then I can get a photon. Like this vacuum uh, photon can excite me from G to E um, and then create a P excitation out of nowhere. But because our environment is vacuum, the only thing that happened to this one photon that can get lost, okay. which is yeah, described sense. well by this gamma and gamma S. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for Thank the you. question. More questions, yeah. Okay. Um, so now, interestingly, these equations uh, for these single photon amplitudes are the same as the equations for that you would get for a classical coherent input. So if instead of having a single photon coming in, uh, you know, with this particular shape, um, if instead you had a coherent pulse uh, with this shape, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, uh, very weak. It can be, you know, uh, not so weak. The equations for these coherent amplitudes would be exactly the same. Uh, and you can also see it from these operator equations here, basically. If you uh, act with these operator equations on a coherent state, uh, you know, these uh, 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 annihilation operators would just be replaced with the corresponding coherent amplitudes. Uh, so uh, that's why kind of these uh, equations for the single photon amplitudes can also be basically studied by working with classical light. And people really like doing this. So. Uh, people would study with classical light and then they would make predictions for what would happen to single photons. Okay, any more questions on this slide? I have a question. Um, yes. So does this mean that under this assumption that the dynamics is described more by a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian than a Limblad now, since we've dropped the noise terms? 
and you just yeah. So uh, if you you could you know uh, you could be very careful. You could be careful. You could uh, write down the full uh, Lindblad you know uh, master equation uh, master equation, and then uh, the only thing that the and then uh, you can right at the moment you know the the trace of the psi of t is uh, you know falling as a function of time because uh, you lose some amplitude for gamma and gamma s. Um, but then the only thing that happens is that uh, you just start populating the vacuum component. So you could write down the full master equation and compute the uh, calculate the evolution of the vacuum component, and you will just find that it grows precisely to keep the total density matrix, uh, you know, uh, to have trace one. So it's like uh, it's it's this work that you don't want to be doing because uh, whatever population is not in this single excitation uh, manifold, it will just be in vacuum, and there'll be no correlations between vacuum and that. So uh, so you don't need to compute it basically. I see. Thank you. Excellent question. Thank you, Daniel. More questions. Okay, good. So, and now this is very simple. You know, these are again, just differential equations with very uh, well-defined initial conditions and boundary conditions. Right, and I'm gonna replace this now with an E because uh, you know, that's what we're gonna have here. This uh, amplitude of the single photon. And for simplicity, for the rest of the talk, I will actually ignore this decay rate of this state. So it will not be important. Um, of course, uh, in reality, it's important. I mean, if this is a Rydberg state, you need to worry about its finite life. But for simplicity, I'll ignore it. Okay, so these are our equations. Um, and let's first do a really simple sanity check. I will assume that there are no atoms. Um, so no atoms means that either this coupling constant G is zero or the density is zero. So G squared of N is zero. So this thing is zero. And then this is the only equation that we get. So what does this equation say? Well, it means that uh, we, our photon is just propagating um, um, in an undistorted fashion. So whatever pulse is coming in at z equal to zero, it just propagated, propagating in an undistorted fashion like this with velocity c, very simple. So, uh, and this is just coming from that first term in the Hamiltonian, uh, e dagger d d z uh, e, very nice. Okay, any questions on this, uh, the no atom case? This should be simple. Or in anything else from before? Okay, and now we're slowly getting to, uh, to, uh, to Leo's question. So we did the no atoms case. So now let's do the, uh, the, uh, uh, the two level medium. So let's assume that our photon that is coming in is resonant, meaning that delta is equal to zero. And let's assume that there is no control field. This omega is equal to zero. So let's assume this. Uh, and that's what Victor was, uh, Leo, excuse me, was, uh, was asking about. Um, so uh, because uh, omega is zero, um, you know, we can forget about S. S will never be populated. And we just left with the first equation and the second equation uh, you know, up to this term, uh, not including this term. And delta is set to zero because I just assume my incoming photon is resonant. So now we have these very simple equations. So how do we solve these equations? We uh, go to the uh, uh, Fourier transform in time. So uh, time, uh, oh man, that's a typo. This should be uh, E z omega. Uh, it's not Fourier transform in space, it's Fourier transform in time. Oh man. And I think it will propagate through all the slides. So it should be E z omega, E tilde z omega. And similarly here, P tilde Z omega. So I just made one typo in the beginning and it just propagated through the entire set of slides. Um, well, at least it proves that I made these slides uh, explicitly for this conference, so for this uh, school. So, uh, um, okay, so it should be E tilde Z omega and P tilde Z omega. And tilde just means that it's the Fourier transform. So I plug these in. Um, oh yeah, and what this omega means, really, it just means uh, that uh, it's a small frequency shift uh, of this field E relative to resonance. So you can also think of, of this omega as the small frequency shift. So now uh, when we replace the E with its Fourier transform, this dt uh, becomes minus I omega and this dp all, dt also becomes minus I omega. And now we have these equations of motion for E tilde Z omega, sorry for the type on P tilde uh, Z omega. Uh, I mean, maybe I can even, no, I'm not going to change it now on the fly. I'll be, uh, uh, I'll be too annoying. Uh, okay, so now um, there is no more time derivative, so we can solve uh, we can solve these two equations. So, so these are the same two equations. 
we first solve for p tilde as a function of e tilde. You know, we bring this uh, term to the left and then we divide by gamma minus i omega, we get this. And then we plug this p tilde into the first equation uh, and we got rid of p tilde. So now the, the, we have the derivative of e tilde with respect to z, the propagation in space. And on the right, we have some function of e tilde. So i omega just comes from here. And uh, this guy multiplied by g squared of n gives us the second term. And this is very easy to solve. Um, so now I fortunately remembered where the omega is. So this equation is correct. So, uh, so it means that uh, e tilde at position l at frequency omega is given by e tilde at position zero at frequency omega times uh, an exponential. It's e to the l, right? So I integrate it with respect to z. So I get uh, this thing times z, and I evaluated it at, uh, at z equal to l. So hopefully this equation makes sense. And now I define uh, this quantity d, which I will explain in a second, but it's g squared and l over gamma c, and I put it in here. So it's just a definition for that. And let's suppose that I don't care about the phase. I just care about the amplitude. So I take the norm squared of both sides. Uh, so then this is just a phase, it doesn't contribute. And here I need to take this and add it to its complex conjugate. Um, and then uh, it's you know, very simple to check. There'll be, uh, you know, you'll have to take the norm of this uh, and what you get is this expression. Um, and I'm gonna study it in the next slide. Um, and I'm gonna explain the meaning of this D in the next slide as well. But first, uh, any questions? Uh, it, it seems like if uh, omega is is equal to gamma, things blow up. Is that something that we should? Oh, I, I think it's a, it's probably a mistake. Uh, it should be a plus. Okay. Oh man, sorry. See that again proves that I did these uh, slides just for this uh, Boulder School. So I'm uh, uh, yeah, it's a strategically placed uh, errors, and also so that uh, you guys can uh, can uh, uh, pay attention. Thank you, Francisco. Um, yeah, lots of typos, um, it's a plus, right? Because it's a gamma minus I omega times gamma plus I omega. Um, and if, it, there were, if there were no I, it would be minus, but because of an I, it's a plus, right? So of course this minus doesn't make sense. And, and, and I guess the statement is just saying that if we're very far off resonant, we don't really care about this exponential. Yeah, yeah, and you will see it exactly. That's what I'm gonna explain in the next slide, exactly. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, and then I just copy pasted it. So it should be a plus. Uh, this right here is a plus, I'm sorry. Um, right, so, uh, so what this means is that if we're on resonance, if omega is equal to zero, then we just, uh, the output intensity is equal to the input intensity times e to the minus 2d. And uh, this is the definition of optical depth. The 2d is the optical depth. So uh, that's how people define optical depth. The output intensity is equal to the input intensity times e to the minus optical depth. Now, sometimes I will be forgetting about this factor of two and sometimes I'll refer to d itself as an optical depth. Um, so I apologize for this. Uh, right. And we will assume that the, our medium is sufficiently uh, you know, optically thick, that d is much greater than one. So in this case, exactly as Francisco pointed out, now, if you plot this thing here, where this is a plus again, so that's a Lorentzian, um, but then we are doing e to the minus the exponential of this Lorentzian with a large d much larger than one, then your transmission, which is output intensity divided by the input intensity as a function of omega, it's basically zero uh, for small frequencies. And then for very large frequencies, we don't see the atoms uh, at all. For very large frequencies, it's perfect transmission. And now the width of this thing, uh, again, remember it's a plus here, the width is a uh, uh, gamma times square root of D. So, uh, um, so gamma just cancels this gamma and then the square root of D gets squared to cancel that D. So the width of this is gamma square root of D. So the more uh, optically thick our medium is, the wider is this absorption line. So this is the uh, absorption of resonant uh, uh, two level medium, uh, um, uh, by a resonant two-level medium of an incoming photon. Kind of that's the, uh, the basics of very simple quantum optics. Any questions on this? And sorry about this plus type here. No questions? Okay.
Right, but of course this is boring, right? So um, um, uh, this is boring because we don't want our photons to be absorbed. Uh, we want, uh, you know, maybe to do a gates between photons. You know, uh, we want to um, um, have one photon act on another photon. Maybe we, have to, uh, we want one photon to stop another photon. But here, you know, you know, the photons interacting strongly with this medium, but they're just lost, they're scattered. Uh, so how do we fix this? That's where we introduce this third level. Um, and this is sort of aiming to answer Leo's question, you know, why, why third level? Uh, so we couple our state E to this uh, state R with a uh, resonant uh, classical field with Rabi frequency omega, which we introduced so laboriously in, in, in earlier slides. So, and these are the equations that I've already derived. So that's very convenient. Um, we just need to solve them. So for the rest of the talk, I'll assume omega is real. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, you know, that there were these typos on omega versus omega star as well. Um, and I copy pasted, of course. So this should be Z omega, Z omega and Z omega. So the Fourier transform is with respect to time uh, and not uh, frequency. So it's Z omega, Z omega, Z omega, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but now every dt gets replaced with minus i omega. So that's very simple. And now we just need to solve these equations, which are now uh, you know, simple differential equations and there is even no time derivative. And let's first assume that omega, this omega is actually zero. So we have resonant light coming in. And this is kind of the epitome of EIT that I'm explaining. So this omega is zero. It means that P tilde is zero. Since P tilde is zero, this, uh, the second equation just gives a simple proportionality between E tilde and S tilde. It means that S tilde is just minus G squared of N divided by omega times E tilde. Um, and then because P tilde is zero, amazingly, and omega is zero, it amazingly tells us that, uh, that we have perfect transmission. So E tilde doesn't uh, you know, change at all. Uh, despite the fact that we have this gamma decay, um, you know, before E tilde was exponentially uh, being absorbed as a function of position, and we got this large optical depth and everything was scattered. But now we introduce this control field that we have perfect transmission. So E tilde doesn't change with position, no scattering. And this is what EIT is. Um, so let me talk more about this and how it uh, comes about. You know, so what happens physically is as this photon comes in, um, it excites this S tilde excitation, which is you know, some of these uh, R, uh, this R excitation. And as this excitation propagates through the medium, it propagates as this coupled atom photon excitation called a dark state polariton. So the reason it's called dark is because P tilde is zero, so there's no E state in it. It's a superposition of basically R and the photon. Um, and that's why this gamma doesn't uh, get a chance to act because there is no support on E. Um, so I'll talk more about this, but any questions on this? So the reason it's taking place, maybe I'll say one more thing and then I'll ask again for questions, um, is that because we have some population in S and some population in E, uh, our field omega is trying to de-excite us from uh, S to, uh, to P, you know, and our G squared of N is trying uh, to absorb the photon uh, again into E, but these two processes destructively interfere and we never create any P. So uh, this uh, dark state polariton sets up this destructive interference and gives you this lossless propagation through our uh, three level medium. So this is this amazing thing, right? Where now our photons are now strongly coupled to the atoms. You know, this photon drags with it uh, this S excitation that moves together with the photon but it doesn't get scattered. Like there's no scattering is taking place. So we achieve this strong coupling without scattering. So Garrett's asking, is it possible to reach the same conclusion using the optical block equations? Um, so let's see. Um, I mean, so let's see, so the optical block equations have the, uh, you know, have the evolution um, of the atoms, but do they have the, I mean, the optical block equations don't really study the prop, do they study the propagation of light? Um, I mean, in some, in, I mean, in some sense, I mean, in some sense, these are the optical block equations, right? Uh, like the evolution of P and S, 
driven by the field E, these are the optical block equations. But now, in addition to seeing how the light acts on the atoms, I also want to study how the atoms act on the light. And this, this light propagation, I think, is usually not part of the uh, optical block equations. But, but maybe, I mean, you can say there's some generalized optical block equations. But essentially, that's what this is, yes. More questions? We introduced the capital delta, which was the detuning, and now it seems yes. to have disappeared. And does it have a role? It's coming. I, you know, I'm gonna sort of uh, unfold this piece by piece. So I first uh, forgot about delta. I studied the two-level atom. Then I added this uh, omega. And now on the next slide, I'm gonna introduce this uh, detuning delta back in and explain the same thing now with the detuning. So uh, you know, I'm trying to be as pedagogical as possible because that's what Caden and Leo are asking. Um, could you just re-explain what is the dark state polariton? Like which excitation yeah, is this? That? A, yeah, so you see so that here, like we had this field that was coming in, E tilde, but now, and that's outside the medium. So outside the medium, you know, you know, we just studied this case, no atoms, remember? Uh, there, were, there was no atoms, it was just field E tilde and it was propagating. Now, when it gets inside the medium, it also, you know, creates some S tilde amplitude. Um, and, you know, as this thing moves through the medium, there's some E tilde and some S tilde. And so is this couple, couple the, you know, a couple the photonic and atomic excitation. And that's what's the dark state polariton is. So it's the uh, E tilde and S tilde excitations moving together. Thank you, more questions? All right, and again, there are typos here. So this is Z omega, Z omega, Z omega. And just to make sure, uh, yep. if the R had a gamma S that you had earlier, then this would sort of break down, I guess. Yeah, it'll be a problem. Exactly, exactly. This would this would uh, this would uh, add to the decay of this, uh, you know, uh, to this uh, polariton. So this S tilde would now have a finite life. I need to worry about it. Yes. Exactly. So then you will not get perfect transmission. You will not get perfect transmission even uh, for this. Uh, for this omega equal to zero case, yes. Very good. What's the typical lifetime ratio between the R and the E state? Um, so that uh, that depends on how high in R you, you go. Um, I mean, it can be, um, so this is, can be like a few nanoseconds. Um, I mean, yeah, it could be, it could be like 10 to the three, you know. Uh, um, so it could be huge, yeah. Like the entire experiment could potentially uh, happen faster than the decay rate of that state. And it becomes better and better the higher you go in this Rydberg levels. Although I didn't introduce Rydberg states yet. So, uh, you know, for now it's just some mysterious long lived state. Yeah, so uh, it's coming, but you've heard Antoine's talks. Um, um, and if you're lucky, you know, maybe you'll hear Caden's talk, uh, but maybe you won't be lucky as he told me earlier today. So more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, how do I interpret yep. um, omega being zero? So you you described it here as like a shift of e yeah, from no, g. Oh, maybe it's my. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, yeah, we can hear it fine. Uh, Caden forgot to mute himself. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So you described e, uh, omega being zero, or you described omega as being kind of the shift of e from yes, the, yes. with e to g. But I've always right. interpreted omega of the Fourier transform as describing like the frequency scales of the dynamics of the quantity. So I would interpret omega being zero as like a, a long time kind of dynamics. Uh, uh, no, how do I reconcile well, so, these yeah, two? Yeah, yeah. Right, right, yeah. So let's, uh, so suppose actually, instead of studying, you know, I kind of said, let's send in a pulse, you know, uh, suppose I don't send the pulse. Suppose I send in, in fact, a, uh, a monochromatic incoming field, you know, uh, a field, an incoming field that's actually has frequency, you know, this little omega equal to zero. So, uh, you know, I assume that this E tilde of, um, 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 I guess it's a delta function. It's, a, it's just uh, at uh, little omega uh, equal to zero. So I'm just studying an incoming monochromatic field and I'm looking at the response. And then uh, setting omega equal to zero in these equations is exactly studying the response uh, of my uh, medium to this monochromatic resonant field. And this monochromatic resonant field would set up this, uh, you know, this combination of equations. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Thanks. You can think of it just a long pulse also. You can think of a long pulse that's, you know, uh, 
you know, at frequency, you know, uh, close to uh, omega equal to zero, so close to resonance. Uh, yeah. You know. Excellent questions. More questions? Thank you, Daniel. So, so Alex, say, uh, maybe it's good to go back for a second, just pedagogically, for to a uh, Jay's coming Hamiltonian, where you have only two levels, just for a second. So there, you know, you get the state. You know, the eigenstate is a linear combination of uh, you know, n photons and de-excited atom and uh, yep. and minus one photons and excited atom. Yep. And, and so, you know, and, and in that sense, you know, your state is a, you know, linear combination and their energy or the information is being cycled back and forth between exactly. or shuttled back and forth between the excited state and an extra photon and vice versa. Perfect. Yes. Okay. So is it fair to say that here it's analogous uh, where the excited state is actually the R state and, you know, and then the E photon, the, uh, not the E photon, the, yeah, the E photon and the R is what this polariton is, but now you've achieved it with a combination of E photon and a classical field, which goes through the intermediate E state, uh, which remains dark because the linear combination is still, you know, R and G, you know, it is still R with one less E photon and G with one more E photon. I only have one photon, but yes, what you're describing is exactly right. So let's suppose I have just one photon and suppose, forget about this propagation. Suppose as a, um, you know, you know, it was suggested, suppose we have just a, you know, a single mode field. So there's no DZ, we just have DTE times IG squared of NP and then DTP, yeah. forget about this decay rate gamma for a second. Suppose there's no S and I have a IG squared of NE. So these equations, this flip-flopping between P and E is exactly Jane's Cummings Hamiltonian. Exactly, um, yeah, that's, right. that's what I'm trying to say, yeah. Right, exactly. But now it's, in it's addition just a, to this- Yeah, it's yeah, just right. this first quant, it's just a single photon version of that where there you have a yes. whole ladder yes. of states, right? Okay. Uh -huh. Yes, it's a single, single photon version of this. And now I'm allowing for this extra state. So in addition to flip-flopping between E and P, as you would see in the uh, Jane's Cummings model, you can also flop from P to S, and in this three level situation, it turns out that you can now set up a linear combination of E and S that never flips to P. It's a dark state. It's a right, linear combination right. of E and S that destructively interferes and never goes to P. And this is good because P is the one that's lossy. Uh, right, right, right. So, I mean, so therefore effectively, that's what I was trying to say. It flops between E and S and that's yes, it. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Well, it doesn't even flop. I mean, I set up a, uh, it kind of, uh, creates a superposition of S and uh, E yeah, that's you yeah, know, yeah. stable. Yeah, the, the flopping is stopped, uh, yeah. Well, it's, right, I mean, it's uh, it's, a, it's, it's actually an eigenstate. Yeah, yes, it's an eigenstate, frame, exactly. It's an eigenstate, yes. much like in the James Cumming Hamiltonian, you know, one extra photon yes. and D excited out. Exactly, it. exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's now an eigenstate okay. of S and E as opposed to an eigenstate of P and E. And the eigenstate exactly. of P and E is annoying because that decays uh, with you know rate proportional to gamma, but this thing doesn't. Perfect. Thank you, Leo. But why isn't it, but why isn't there a decay of R? I forgot. Or like why isn't there? Yeah, there is a decay of R. There is a decay of R. I mean, we ignored it because usually R is long as a long-lived Rydberg state. Um, oh, I but, see. I see. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Good. Good. Then I'm with you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Leo. More questions. I love the questions, thank you. Okay, I can move on. So, um, so, so far, you know, I just studied what happens uh, to the, uh, like at omega equal to zero. Let's be a little bit more careful and see what happens near omega equal to zero. So at omega equal to zero, I show that we have perfect transmission and uh, you know, it's consistent here, but near omega equal to zero, it turns out we have this, uh, you know, we have this Gaussian. Uh, for very small omega. And I'm not gonna derive this. Feel free to do this exercise and derive it yourselves. Uh, so what this means is that if I now plot the transmission, if I didn't have this omega turned on, remember we derived this uh, uh, GE absorption line from before, but because we turned on this omega, 
around omega equal to zero, we open this narrow transmission window whose tip is described by this equation right here. And this is the EIT transparency window. Um, and its bandwidth uh, is a omega squared of a gamma squared of D, which you can read out from here. Um, and now you see why it's called electromagnetically induced transparency, right? So we, uh, we uh, like before we applied this omega, we had this absorption, you know, complete absorption on resonance. Now we apply this classical electromagnetic field and we induce the transparency. And now at omega equal to zero, we have a transparency. Questions? Okay, so, so far we studied absorption. How about the phase? Um, so it turns out, I mean, you can derive very easily that a, a near omega equal to zero, the phase uh, of the uh, uh, electric field evolves actually like this, where this VG is omega squared of a G squared of N, a G squared N times C. Um, and now if you take this and just uh, uh, go back to, uh, uh, from frequency space to time. Um, so this I minus I omega becomes a DT. You just get this equation. So you see it's the same equation that we had uh, for a free field, except the speed of light got replaced with this VG. Uh, and experimentally, because of this collective enhancement, this G squared N is usually much larger than omega squared. It could be, uh, you know, this could be, you know, six orders of magnitude larger than this omega squared. Um, so it's much smaller than the speed of light. So it turns out that inside this medium, these dark state polaritons propagate with a reduced group velocity. And that's where you get this slow light phenomenon. Um, so uh, it means that outside we're propagating with the speed of light, according to this here. Inside we're propagating with this reduced group velocity. Um, and because we're going from fast velocity to slow velocity, Inside the medium, this pulse can be compressed uh, exactly by this factor omega squared over g squared n. So uh, it can be compressed by a factor of 10 to the six, uh, which is very nice because it means that if you have an initial pulse that's you know, uh, you know, very, very long, you can compress it inside the medium. It can now fit into your short medium. Any questions? How is this sort of related to, I guess, like refractive index, is it a refractive index? Yes, very good, very good. So, uh, so this is how it's related to the refractive index. Um, um, the refractive index is basically a, the imaginary part of your susceptibility. You know, those who don't know what that is, I mean, don't worry about it. But for those who do, like, uh, um, I guess Vibov, you asked that question. Um, so uh, the way it's related is that, uh, you know, this uh, basically uh, coefficient here in front of uh, E tilde, the imaginary part of this is exactly your refractive index. Uh, and the uh, small group velocity at omega equal to zero means a large slope of your uh, refractive index. Uh, and this large slope, you know, uh, is accompanying uh, this uh, very narrow uh, transmission window. So it's exactly uh, you know, a very uh, fast change of the refractive index with respect uh, as a function of omega. Thank you. I mean, just to, more questions. You know, susceptibilities yeah. always have this relationship between the real and imaginary parts, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Exactly, that's exactly what it is. The Kramick's Kroeninger relation between a, a very narrow transmission line and a wild uh, you know, change in the refractive index. More questions? So maybe a naive question. So, so for large omega, I know it's boring. So we are interested in the resonance or near resonant condition. So, but uh, uh, I, I would be curious how, so how robust is this? Uh, this, I mean, especially for practical purpose, you need, you may need the omega close to zero, right? You cannot go much uh, further away from omega to zero. So how robust right. is this game? Yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to go through this math, but uh, what you're saying is, uh, like, on the one hand, um, this little omega, like, if I want to take advantage of this, uh, you know, the transmission window, and if I want to take advantage of the uh, um, uh, uh, small group velocity, my omega has to be, like, within this, within this narrow window. Um, 
At the same time, um, if I have a um, so if I have a very small um, omega uh, window, it means my pulse is very long in time, right? So a small, uh, if, if, if I free transform this delta omega, if delta omega must be small, it means the pulse must be long. So there is actually a, some sort of a, uh, uh, some sort of a trade-off, uh, right? Like, can I actually fit my pulse inside the medium? And the condition for fitting the pulse inside the medium is basically that the optical depth D is much larger than one. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking. Was that, does this answer your question? Or maybe you can try asking again. Yeah, I, I can imagine there's a trade-off there. So, so yes, yeah, so if, if Omega, I mean, let's say it's not that near, let's say a larger width of the Omega. So yeah, I can see a trade-off kind of that, but. Okay. Yeah, so there is a trade-off. You know, if you're trying to fit inside the medium, you don't want your pulse to be too long to begin with. So you try to make it shorter and shorter and shorter. But eventually, if you make it too short, then in frequency space, it starts sticking outside of this, you know, simple regime of uh, transmission, perfect transmission and, uh, and uh, small group velocity. And so you try to choose the optimum. And, and if the optical depth is D is much larger than one, you know, I can derive these formulas if you want, but I'm not gonna bore you. Uh, and you can find that it, it can be made to work. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. So uh, Garrett, uh, maybe do you just wanna unmute and ask your question? Yeah, go for it, Garrett. You used to ask questions. Oh, maybe you're afraid of your microphone. I see, I see, I remember, oh, yeah. yeah. No, I okay, see, yeah, right. okay. So. It's um, working, the microphone is good now. Oh, you don't have Go for it. I don't know if you saw the comment, but him oh, and Mike yeah. were yes. in the same room. Sorry. And there was an oh, interference. Yeah. That's what was the issue earlier. Oh, I see. I didn't see that. Oh, I see. OK. Um, hey, Garrett, go for yeah, it. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I guess in my notes, I have it written that, the, um, that it was the real part of the susceptibility, the electric susceptibility that yielded. Yeah, yeah, sorry. It's the real part of the susceptibility, but susceptibility gets multiplied by i. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh. I misspoke. Okay. The susceptibility is actually I times the susceptibility. I'm sorry, I I I, I, see. I misspoke. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Very good. Very good. People are people are on top of it. People are listening, correcting mistakes and typos. I'll Thank say, you, uh, it's clear why the uh, you know uh, suppression of transmission away from the peak is of order gamma because that's just you want to be on resonance between G and E to, to, to have the medium to be opaque and absorb photons. But what is the, what controls the width of the uh, central peak again? Yeah, right. So let me go back. Um, right. Um, right. So I skipped this derivation, um, but um, so yeah, man. So how can I? Um, so, so before um, the with Leo, just, I, I didn't want to make sure that I understood your question correctly. No, where does this where does this come from? So uh, where does this, yeah. why is this omega to the fourth over d gamma squared? Um, but but um, but I thought you said there was absorption at omega equal to zero. There's no absorption at omega equal zero, right? That's where there's perfect transmission. No, no. Leo no, said no, that he understands. He understands where this. He understands where this is coming yeah. from. I understand. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and that you can disentangle. Suppose you shut off capital omega, so there's no yeah. r anymore. Then you have that first curve. So yeah. And and then yeah. So go ahead. If is there some intuition? For how you know yeah, what for this for it, this formula? Oh man, yeah. Is there an intuition for this formula? It seems pretty complicated. It involves both capital omega and gamma, so it's pretty yeah, hard. yeah. Okay, well maybe yeah, maybe not on the fly, but anyway, it it seems like that's yeah, the sorry, figure yeah. of merit. That seems yes, like yes, that's yes, a crucial yes. figure of merit that you want. Right? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. So well, I cannot you know. So one thing, right? Yeah. Right, so the width is given by this, so that's the formula. Now, I mean, one thing I can say is that if you just solve, um, if you don't have any propagation, and if you just try to s solve a, kind of a single atom problem, um, 
and just, uh, you know, you just study scattering of a single atom that you're shining this classical field on. And, uh, you know, and then you are trying to uh, send a weak light, you know, at, as detuning little omega. And you try to see, you know, how the atom responds. You will see that the, the, the width of this response feature is omega squared over gamma. So maybe this omega squared over gamma is something that you've seen before. Um, so if you it's have- It's kind of second order healthy. perturbation. It's kind of second exactly. order perturbation it's like, theory. It's like your in optical imaginary pumping rate. Frequency. Yes, yes. It's omega squared over gamma. It's like optical pumping rate, second order perturbation theory. And then maybe square root of D then, well, square root of D is harder to explain. Um, but what is, I mean, it's a little bit, I'm now a little bit uh, concerned about the dimensions. What is D? D is space. Uh, oh, D is just length. the optical depth. It's the optical depth that was defined. Um, but it was in units of so or something. It's dimensionless. No, yeah, it's it's right here. It's the uh, it's the dimensionless number that you uh, put on the exponent uh, to uh, say how uh, how much the incoming intensity gets uh, uh, absorbed uh, to give you the uh, output intensity. That's a, that's it's a number, uh, and I it's see. much larger than one. Can you give its expression? Where's the expression? One slide back. Yeah. Um, you had it. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that's the expression. So some G, it involves okay. the, the density. It's it's proportional to density, which is good. It's proportional yeah. to the uh, kind of the matrix element between E and G. It's proportional mm -hmm. to the length of the medium. So these are all things mm -hmm. that make sense. Okay, so they make sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, more questions on the, uh, we're now the refractive index. Um, yeah, okay. More questions? Okay, right, okay. So now something else that will be important, and I guess the stuff that will be important will get you know the uh, lecture tomorrow, which will be the last lecture, but something that you can now do uh, with this uh, EIT is the, to store a photon in the medium. It will be important for us. Um, so this is again, the formula for our reduced group velocity. Um, and this is how you can think of this dark state polariton. So uh, it's a uh, superposition of a photon and the R excitation with this particular you know, uh, relative amplitudes. I'm, I'm dropping some prefactor here. Um, and then uh, it's propagating at group velocity VG, uh, you know, in space. Uh, so that's how you should be thinking of it. And now let's suppose that as it propagates, as it is propagating through the medium, you know, it got compressed, it's propagating through the medium, and then we turn off omega. So we turn off omega, two things happen. You know, VG uh, drops to zero, you know, and simultaneously this piece drops to zero. Um, and uh, what we're left with is just a, uh, an excitation of just a spin wave. Ah, maybe something I should say at this point, you know, when I wrote it like this, this also gives you the intuition for why the group velocity is reduced. Um, so this omega squared over G squared N is exactly the fraction, the photonic fraction inside your dark state polariton. So uh, this is the how much photonic uh, component you have. Um, and uh, the, only the photonic component is what causes the propagation. So the smaller the photonic component is, the smaller this ratio is, the smaller is the velocity. So it's a fraction of the speed of light because you only have a fraction of a photon. And once you've turned it off completely, you have no photon left and it doesn't move at all. Um, and what this thing is, you know, we call it a, a, a spin wave. So it's a single excitation from G to R, except the spread over many atoms with some uh, envelope, uh, you know, F of Z. And then if eventually we turn omega back on, we uh, recreate this polariton and it propagates back out and we retrieve our photon. So this is the uh, physics be uh, behind quantum memories, you know, photon storage and retrieval, uh, it's uh, popular stuff. And it'll be useful for us once we introduce uh, Rydberg states and the, uh, likely in the next lecture, and, or maybe uh, I will briefly introduce them now. Uh, more questions? So for now, the fact that it's a Rydberg state played no role. Doesn't matter, no role state, at all. Yeah. It could be any yeah. state. Rydbergs have not played a role until now and still not now. So it will be important uh, after I introduce the Rydberg atoms. Didn't, didn't questions? We need, oh, sorry, I was just gonna ask. Didn't we need the Rydberg state to have the long lifetime or? Yeah, yeah, but it could have been some other state with long lifetime, you know, so. Uh, okay, gotcha. 
But Rydberg states provide this long lifetime. In addition, they provide the strong interactions. We haven't yet uh, made use of the interactions, but we've made use of the lifetime, yes. So another question I would have is this is all pretty much single atom physics, or you know, you have a cloud, but there aren't necessarily atom-atom interactions being very important. Um, yes. But, but as I understand, most of the experiments in this, maybe all of them have been sort of uh, cold gases. Is that just to get rid of Doppler shifts and things, or why do you have to do this in cold atoms? Oh, yes. Why have, right, exactly. So atoms move fast, um, and uh, like a bunch of things can happen. You know, uh, you can, you know, sort of create this S, you know, and the atom that has the S moves out. Um, then, yes, then Doppler. Um, so, uh, there have been, in fact, there are some experiments that do it with warm atoms. Uh, so Tillman Fowl, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Robert Lowe. Um, um, and they just have to do their stuff really fast. Um, yes, very good question. So this works much better with cold atoms, and that's why it fits so well into this ultra-cold battery summer school. More questions? Thank you, Caden. Okay, so yeah, let me just then wrap up with this off resonant two level medium um, uh, and then, um, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Nung had a question, was it answered and I missed it or? Yes, yes, it works for the Lambda system as well. Actually, I realized that I can open the chat window on my other screen. So yeah, it's, it's identical. What I described right now works for a Lambda medium even better in fact, because I don't have to worry about the lifetime of the R state. The R state is in the bottom. Um, um, Right, so it works uh, just as well for the Lambda system. In fact, it was first developed for Lambda systems. I just did it for this, ver for this vertical system because I wanted to be Rydberg state in the next lecture. More questions? Okay, so now somebody asked, hey, why did you lose that detuning? Let's put the detuning back in. So suppose we have now an off resonant two level medium. So uh, two levels, there's no R, but now we have a detuning. So what happens? Remember on resonance, things got absorbed. What happens now? So we have our equations now, you know, and I assume I have a large delta. Uh, so let's uh, suppose delta is so large that I can ignore gamma. I again, free transform in time. Um, and I get my um, uh, equations. So I dropped gamma. Omega is now again, this little detuning. And then near omega equal to zero, you know, I can actually set omega to zero and just solve. Uh, uh, so I set omega to zero. Then I solve for P from this equation, plug it in there. And then I have this equation. So look, so now E tilde experiences no absorption because delta is so large that I dropped gamma. There's no absorption. Everything is now unitary and dispersive. Um, so E tilde only picks up a phase. Um, and in fact, the phase that it picks up over a uh, 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 medium length uh, L is D gamma over delta, where D is again this optical depth or half of the optical depth. So a uh, uh, off resonant medium of length L and optical depth D uh, imprints a phase on uh, our photon that's equal to D gamma over delta. Of course, you know, if uh, gamma over delta is not too small, there'll be also some absorption, but I assume it's small. And now if we turn on again, this uh, Rabi frequency omega, exactly the same thing happens as before. So everything will be now the same. Same for delta equal to zero. You know, see, P tilde is still zero when omega is equal to zero. So when P tilde is zero, you know, this delta doesn't even matter. When P tilde is zero, it doesn't matter whether we had here a delta or not. So everything is the same. We get this relation between S tilde and E tilde. We have a perfect transmission due to EIT, dark state polariton, um, group velocity propagation, reduced group velocity, slow light. Everything is exactly the same. Um, okay. So uh, actually, this uh, is actually a very good place uh, to stop. Um, um, so, uh, we now covered EIT. So we introduced the photons, we covered EIT. So, uh, so the next lecture, we will, uh, very, very briefly introduce Rydberg states because I'm assuming Antoine introduced them, uh, kind of laboriously, uh, and, uh, in great detail. So I'll just briefly remind you what they are. And then, uh, we will study finally interactions between photons. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's what, oh yeah. So Antoine and Caden, maybe we'll talk about it. 
I don't know if uh, Adam and Wasim uh, talked or will talk about Rydbergs, uh, but they but they work in them certainly. Um, so yeah, uh, any questions? So we'll do this next time. So questions about anything today? Um, Thanks, Alexei. Um, yeah, I have one quick question about the yeah. width of the EIT. So this formula that you get this omega squared over gamma, I guess root d or whatever. Um, yeah. It, is that assuming that gamma is much larger than omega, or is that not an assumption here? I don't think it's an assumption. Um, okay. I mean, it's I'm just, just it, gamma. It's, yeah. yeah, I don't think it's an assumption. Yeah, gotcha. Because it looks like second order perturbation theory, but I didn't. See right, it. right. And we we kind of said that. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's an assumption. Uh, let's see. It was right here. Uh, it's because gamma actually gets. Um, Yeah, so gamma in some sense gets enhanced by by d. Um, so um, so you don't need to assume that gamma is small. Um, but are we assuming then that d is large? D is much greater than yes, d. yes. D is d is large. Uh, like all of this stuff holds only when d is large. If d is not large, this is all nonsense. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, uh, so just saying the same thing in a different language. It's it's the it's a Zeno formula, right? It's the it's it looks like you've got an omega coupling into a really broad line that's much greater than omega. Yeah, I think that'll be correct. Yeah, I think that's probably correct. Anyway, um, so Jaren, you have a question? Yeah, so um, just to clarify, um, the photon slows down um, around omega zero, right? Or at, yes. at zero? Yep. Yeah, so, um, the, so is, this, is this like a, um, a memory, quantum memory? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's what I said. That's photon storage. That's quantum memory. Yeah, I said that. Um, this is exactly uh, this is exactly the physics of quantum memories for light. Yeah, that are so popular. Mm -hmm. I just explained that because uh, you know the way we're going to be doing our interactions. The simplest thing is uh, basically to store one photon in a Rydberg state and have another photon run by using EAT on a second Rydberg state, and that's the cleanest way to study it. But yes, this is exactly the physics of quantum memories. Yep. Okay, so do we like store like the polarization of the photon in that case in the medium or? So for in this particular case, I just assume they have a three level medium. So whatever polarization is on this G transition, that's the one I'm storing. Mm -hmm. um, but of course there are, you know, experiments that are, uh, you know, store several polarization at once and then the, and everything, yeah. Okay, I have one more question. Uh, that was something that you mentioned um, right at the end. Um, if you can go to that slide. Here, yes, here we were dropping gamma, but then it's- Oh, yeah. And in the exponential- Ah, yes, 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 that's funny. That's the that's how D is defined. So D has a one over gamma in it. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so D gamma actually doesn't depend on gamma. That's funny, yeah, good, good okay. cash. Okay, so Garrett, I think Garrett has some questions, yeah. Yeah, okay, so did you, did I hear you mention before that G, so the lowercase G, did, did I hear you mention before that that was something like the coupling between the two states? Like yeah, exactly, G, G, G has a G inside of it, little g, and which has nothing to do with this G, right? but, uh, but this G right here is proportional to the off diagonal matrix element between E and G, and it's also proportional to the uh, kind of the uh, single photon electric field amplitude on top of that atom. Okay, so does, hmm. Okay, so does G, does G get larger, closer to resonance? No, so G doesn't change. What so gets, change. Uh, what, gets what gets larger is uh, how much your photon interacts with the atom. So the off diagonal element doesn't change, but if your diagonal element, which is this delta, you know, is too large, uh, then you never really excite this E state. You only like kind of virtually excite it. Um, I see. So what happens is that this delta kind of competes with this uh, with this g squared of n. Okay. Mm. Also. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. Give me a moment to think about that. Sounds good. 
So just experimentally, can you comment on like, what is the state of the art of dealing with EIT? How long can you stop light for this kind of thing? How coherent? Um, um, I mean, people are getting much better at it. You know, people are storing it now, you know, solid state, people are storing it in atomic ensembles, but uh, I mean, I'm not sure I can even tell you what's the best right now. You know, I actually, I actually kind of stopped uh, closely following this uh, quantum memory stuff because it's a little, uh, it's a little boring. <laughs> um, so, uh, so maybe if not the state of the art, can you at least? So you obviously have worked on some experiments where uh, you know you're creating interacting Rydberg ensembles. What are typical lifetimes there? Like, uh, well, so it depends. Like, so you don't want to be storing your um, excitation in the Rydberg state for too long. Uh, you know, precisely because, uh, well, it has a, um, it has a, it has finite lifetime. And in addition, it's usually not lifetime limited because that's a Rydberg state. You know, it's very uh, sensitive to uh, uh, electric fields. Uh, and so it has some other dephasing and uh, the, the memory kind of dies because of this. So what people do usually with quantum memories is uh, even if they, end up having their excitation in the Rydberg state, they want to map it down to some other state S. And that's what sort of Nong asked about, uh, you know, does this work for Lambda systems? If you're just trying to make a quantum memory for light, a linear quantum memory, don't use a Rydberg state. Um, and then things work extremely well. I mean, these, uh, this SG coherence is, uh, is super long. It can be like uh, incredibly long. You're sort of limited there usually by, not by the lifetime of this S state, you, I mean, typically limited, you know, maybe by like sort of, I don't know, the motion of your atoms or, or some other kind of little things like this. Um, There's another question from Garrett in the chat. Yes, yes, nothing requires the Rydberg levels. Yes, uh, Lee already said that. I just want a stable state here. And I drew it at the top as opposed to at the bottom, just so that you're prepared for me to say that's a Rydberg state. And I also called it R for that reason. Other than that, nothing Rydberg here. Karen, more questions? Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I am, I'm curious about something. So we looked at it from the photon uh, perspective. But when I look at the, um, the, the, you know, resonances, what I see is also a filter, basically. So it's like a um, high pass filter, right? I mean, when we look at the transmission lines, um, especially without yes. EEG. Uh, so can we think of this kind of system then like a, um, like a signal processing unit, unit, like a filtering and a signal processing? Sure, yeah, I mean, yeah, so yeah, yeah, absolutely right. So this is a, uh, let's see, where's the... Um, well, when it was like two level and then you... Yeah, 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 yeah. so uh, let's see. Right, so... Uh, I mean, even, you know, honestly, even without EIT, the two level atom is in fact a filter yeah. and people use it, you know, people have these, uh, you know, chambers where they use the atom to, uh, to filter light. So, uh, so even that's a filter and now EIT, I mean, EIT is alter filters. So this will be an, like the, the original line, it's like an absorption filter, it eats out uh, something. Mm -hmm. And now this guy, you know, it transmits something, absolutely. Um, I think this goes back to the transistor perspective a little bit, right? What is a trans? It's a filter. It's an electromagnetically controllable filter, and so uh, so maybe that's the real advantage here that you can sort of control this filter with light. Right. 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 Thanks. Right. So, right. Garrett is asking, uh, could you reiterate one more time where the Langevin noise terms went? So I assumed I have a single photon. Um, and when I have a single photon, so my noise is vacuum. So it means that uh, my single photon can decay into vacuum. And that's it. Um, so in fact, uh, probably if I wanted to actually, you know, uh, calculate the equations of motion for the vacuum component, you know, after my photon has decayed, I have uh, like, I have no more excitation. I have sort of the, the vacuum of my theory. You know, there are all the atoms are in G and all the photons are gone. So if I wanted to calculate the amplitude for this uh, vacuum component evolution using those Heisenberg equations of motion, I think I would have to get this, uh, you know, the, the, the Langevin noise terms involved. involved. But, uh, but I really don't have to do that because whatever, like as soon as I lose that one photon, I know that it's now in the vacuum state. So I can just compute the amplitude of my wave function, which is decaying, uh, and say that one minus that squared is, a, is the vacuum.
Um, so you know, may I ask if the slow light uh, can be good for using the Doppler shift to measure cold atom velocity? Um, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's possible. Maybe it's even used that way. But uh, I won't. Uh, it's maybe used that way. Maybe somebody knows better. I'm sorry. Okay. We're over time. Caden, should let people go. Oh, everybody can leave whenever they want, but uh, we're having such a good discussion here. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a great place to end. Uh, thanks again for a wonderfully pedagogical lecture, and we're looking forward to whatever the third holds, uh, whenever it is, Friday or tomorrow, whenever you're giving it. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning, yeah. Okay, great. And so uh, until then, enjoy your evening, and I will see you all in the morning.